feel the support of the community. Um, On the day when we went to Los Alamos and, and were standing there, it was um, sort of like being in another world, you know. I, I went in part to honor my father's commitment, and now that my mother has died, I have time to be able to do these things, and I feel so discouraged about our, our democracy. And I, I really don't know what to do anymore when we see the parade of lobbyists in and out of the president's office making deals on the fiscal cliff and the, the people going to corporate whistleblowing and the, the false charges that people, these whistleblowers under this administration have been charged and, you know, doing hard time, long time, 30 months for supposedly giving the name of somebody who worked for the CIA or whatever. I mean, you know, the situation that we're in is pretty dire as far as I'm concerned, and I don't really know what else to do. So I went <clears throat> and I, I took my stand, and now we'll be pretty much at the mercy of the court. So I, it's wonderful to see you all here, and hopefully we'll... Uh, be able to uh, amplify our actions a little bit um, as a result of, of the trial. I don't really know. I mean, you know, we have a long history in our country and certainly um, great uh, people who have gone to jail for years and who are gone uh, now, you know, people like Martin Luther King. I mean, it's, it's can't, I can't even begin to put myself in those footsteps, but I do feel like we have a long tradition of doing this, and so we'll see what happens. But I really thank you, so all of you, so much for being here. Thank you, Barbara. Our next speaker is Kathy Sullivan. nuclear weapons issues at Los Alamos since I was a young woman, free of wrinkles. And uh, that would be the late 1970s. Uh, and uh, since then, I have served with the Los Alamos study group, and I'm currently, and have been for about the last seven years, uh, on Jake Hoglund's nuclear watch in Mexico. And I see Jay over here in the audience, and I want to uh, mention that. Grab that man by the ear. <laughs> I don't think that you can separate the fact that nuclear weapons exist <clears throat> from the threat that they might someday be used in anger or by accident. Nor do I think that these largely Holocaust scale weapons can be separated from Los Alamos lab where so many of them were originally designed. In my opinion, the lab's weapon mission has for seven decades helped create a threat to our future that is greater than the threat from any other war fighting technology, any enemy state, any militant religious group, or any political terrorist group. Yes. I risked arrest in Los Alamos last August to call attention to the lab's ongoing research and development of nuclear weapons. When people tell you that the lab is different now and does many kinds of science, please remind them that in 2012, two-thirds, about 67% of the lab's budget funded core nuclear weapons work. Here briefly are two of my three defenses against being found guilty next Wednesday morning at trial in Los Alamos. The first relates to what humanitarian law has to say about these nuclear weapons. In 1996, the United Nations International Court of Justice found that under humanitarian law, states must never use weapons that cannot distinguish 
between military and civilian targets. But the original incentive behind atomic weapons has precisely been to hold civilian target, civilian populations at risk. Los Alamos first created, then demonstrated, that threat to civilians in the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which interestingly enough I found out recently, were designated as tests in a later official listing of all U.S. nuclear weapon explosions. Given the United Nations Court's opinion on distinguishing between military and civilian targets, the contribution of Los Alamos to the destruction of civilian populations must be described as illegal under international humanitarian law. My second point relates to the 1970 Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in which the United States promised the following to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to nuclear disarmament and on a treaty on general and complete nuclear disarmament under strict and effective international control. However, for the 42 years since we signed the treaty, my country has ignored this promise and whitewashed our non-compliance with rhetoric about good intentions while at the same time browbeating any nation who dared call us out on our bad faith. In their persistent lobby for nuclear weapon funding, Lionel Livermore and Sandia have led the attack on the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Finally, a more general comment about the lab today. Lab efforts to maintain funding for weapons work increased after the Cold War when, with the end of the Soviet Union, the lab needed a new reason to exist. The new argument for funding was to declare more money was essential to keep our weapons safe and reliable and to keep their plutonium triggers in mint condition. What does reliable mean for nuclear weapons, you may ask? I love this. Reliability is knowing beforehand exactly how big the weapons explosion will be. Or, as Bill Hartung at the Center for International Policy said regarding safety and reliability, God forbid you try and end life on Earth and one of the weapons doesn't go off. <laughs> but the fear card has worked well for the lab. Incredibly, budgets have grown to about double their Cold War levels, and today the lab's existential mantra is, we must retain forever the capability to build thousands of nuclear weapons on short notice. I and my co-defendants blocked just one of several lanes of lab traffic for about 10 minutes one morning last August. In part, we did so to draw attention to the leading role the laboratory plays in breaking international humanitarian law, as well as its role in delaying implementation of the promise our nation made in 1970 to work to end the curse of nuclear weapons. Thank you. some very creative. Maybe if you want, you can ask her about the signs that she um, did up at Los Alamos some years ago. It was a good story. Um, our next speaker of the Lanel 6 is Janet Greenwald. Thank you. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I, I really didn't plan uh, to do civil resistance at uh, Los Alamos. Um, when the policeman said, okay, it's time to go, or you will be arrested, all these things started tumbling in my mind. And one of the main um, things that started tumbling 
was Los Alamos as the headwaters of the Rio Grande. Um, and the fact that Santa Fe and Albuquerque now drink Rio Grande water. I know that in Albuquerque, where I'm from, that we're now drinking plutonium. Uh, this plutonium is below regulatory concern. Um, but the EPA drinking water standards for long-lived alpha emitting radionuclides is very much behind the eight ball, scientifically. So the regulations do not protect uh, young children or the unborn. So those were the things that were going through my mind when I forgot to leave. <laughs> Thank you so much for your support. Thank you, Janet. Next up is Pam Gilchrist, who I want to also add, um, as part of the New Free Now event that went on, there had been a hunger strike which started on Trinity Day. And Pam was one of the, one of two who was on a hunger strike from right, there were two of the whole July, 16th. July 16th through Nagasaki Day, which was 15. How many days? It was three three weeks. weeks. It was long. It was long. It was a long time. And uh, Pam was pretty much always smiling and trudging ahead with this. So I want to thank you on both of those counts. And we are there are plans for another hunger strike this year as part of the New Free Now and other groups coming together. And um, there were other people who joined in and we're hoping to create a global hunger strike this year. So stay tuned to hear more about that. Pam Gilchrist. I'm going to ask you to stand up if you're able. If in your life you have done civil disobedience more than three times for a cause you believe in, all right. Um, also, no, okay, keep, keep it up if you can, if you can, all right. Uh, stand if you're able, uh, if you've done civil dis disobedience, um, let's see, once for a cause you believe in. Wow. <laughs> all right, and then, please stand if during the last three years uh, you visited your congressman's local or... Washington, D.C. office. Please stand. If No, you can, anyone who stood can't sit down. All right. And then, <laughs> and then uh, please stand if you have written more than three letters or emails to your congressman in this past year. Now that is impressive. So I am standing here with you, and if you can, just keep standing. Um, I have done all of the above, and yet the wisdom of President Eisenhower's words of 1961 are relevant today. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Climate change is clearly, climate disruption is clearly our greatest global threat. It is this fact that compelled me to protest my tax dollars being used to build and maintain illegal and immoral weapons. We in the Southwest see our water sources drying up and our forests explode in mega wildfires. And without immediate action, we face food scarcity and bioregional death. The Cold War is over. Our security is in cooperating to meet our very basic needs. Now please remain standing for just another moment it's okay if you didn't, if you 
can. Uh, but consider, just consider committing civil disobedience at the 2013 Hiroshima commemoration in Los Alamos. Thank you, and please be seated. I leave you with a question. What will it take to wean ourselves from the DOE and the military industrial tit? <laughs> Thank you for doing what not all of us 
us were brave enough to do it. Maybe this year on Hiroshima Day, many of us who are in the room will, will stand together in civil disobedience up at the lab. It would be interesting to see what would happen if 100 people didn't leave the roadway. Our next speaker is the Lana Six's attorney, Jeff Haas. Thanks, Jeff. Representing uh, political activists for quite some time, starting in the 60s with the Panthers, the anti-war movement, the Young Lords, SDS, and have continued with ACT UP and people who protested against the Central American invasion by the U.S. and then the Iraq invasion and also strongly protest uh, the war that's going on against Iran right now, uh, a cyber war, a sanctions war and who knows if it's going to be a military attack war. But I want to say that it has been my, really my pleasure uh, and honor to represent the Lionel Six. And that in my history, I have never met a more a principled, committed, and dedicated group of people than the people you've just heard from. And I want, I want to just stress how, how uh, impressive they are in their commitment. Um, Basically, as, you, as Michelle told you, <clears throat> this Wednesday, the Los Alamos Six, who you just heard from, or at least five of them, are going to trial at nine in the morning in Los Alamos. The charges are trespass, obstructing movement, and refusing to obey an officer. The potential penalties are 179 days in jail and a $1,500 fine for each of them. The judge is not a lawyer. In fact, he's the former police chief, Alan Kirk, of Los Alamos. So that's the situation that the Los Alamos Six are facing. I think the only thing that can balance that uh, is your presence in the courtroom and outside showing your support. There have been victories in the battles against Los Alamos. As a matter of fact, uh, the funding for the nuclear, for, for the plutonium pit uh, was, was postponed for five years. But the, uh, and it appeared that both the President, the Department of Defense, and the military realized that plutonium pits were unnecessary. However, uh, the battle is far from over. Last week, about three days ago, the NDAA appropriation bill which requires construction of a proposed multi-billion multi dollar plutonium laboratory, which we know as CMRR, and authorizes $70 million in this year to go toward that. Construction is supposed to be complete by 2026. This was done despite the President, military, and Department of Defense supporting its deferment for at least five years, and its likely demise. So why did this happen? Well, it was a lobbyist bill. Bechtel and the other corporations that benefit from the money they make at the labs were the primary sponsors of this bill. They were joined by a Mexico congressman led by Heinrich, who was the one who pushed this bill and added it to the NDAA. And also I want you to know that he got help from Udall and Bingaman. The other supporters were the leading hawks in the Senate, Kyle of Oklahoma, and Turner in the House. So we have right here a great example of the military-industrial complex deliberately producing something that the military realizes is useless. But they did it because it, it gives them political advantages and it gives them money in their pockets. On August 6th, the Lionel Six stood up against this deadly misuse of our resources. This is basically a case where people held their ground in order to get out their message. No more nukes, cleaning up, to clean up the radiation of nearby land and water, jobs for peace, not war, resources for addressing and mitigating climatic, climate change. Mil resources not for the military. Are these messages important enough for you to support them? Yes. Are these messages important enough for you to come to their trial and show the judge and the public we care? Yes. If so, I invite you, I urge you to come to court on Wednesday. 
with signs outside and your presence inside. If you do, their message and their action will not be in vain. Support the Lionel Six, the, lab cry, the, labs cry, the Lab's Crimes Continue, Power to the People. commitment. Um, I was there that day and I stood there and debated, do I leave the road or not? And uh, obviously I left the road because there's not a level 7. Um, and I'm, I, I would really, I'm really considering a different action this year. And um, I think if we have a huge crowd up there, not that that makes the difference, um, but I think it would make a difference in the impact of our action. So, in the meantime, we can all show up in court to support these people, and uh, I think that's so important, and what a statement that will make to the court and to the lab, because they'll be there, that's for sure. Um, I just want to make another quick little pitch for donations, if you're able. There's cans all around. There's one on this table here. You can write a check. Pam has one here. Um, please support the group in any way that you can, with your body, with your dollars, with your phone calls. This is so important. Where and, is the court? How do we find it? Okay, the court <laughs> is next to Ashley Pond in Los Alamos, and the address of the court, it's a new building, Trinity Drive, Trinity Drive, I don't have the address, we will have the address before the end of, before 4.30 comes, and I will tell everybody where it is, but it, yes, I have a suggestion, yes, besides finding out where the court is, which they will take that as um, I would suggest that people who can't make it to the court, uh, there's hundreds of things you can do. There's people you can engage in your community. Uh, one of the things that helped us during the times we spent in jail in Los Alamos uh, in 83 was that we were in the news all the time. People were encouraging uh, reporters. People were writing letters. People were keeping us in front as opposed to being buried in a cell. And so one of the things we all can do is reach out. It wasn't six people who got arrested. It was our community that was standing up and speaking out against things that are wrong. And so we need to continue doing that. Uh, I would like to see next year that all of Los Alamos will be blocking the roads with us. <laughs> it's not us against them. It's an economic issue. And we need to bring to the forefront and put into our dialogues that the people who are working up there see it as a job. They are getting salaries that are incredibly high compared to working in a university environment. So they have an investment, uh, not necessarily a conscious one, for the weapons that they're building. Everybody up there uh, fought that they were protecting the Constitution and our nation by doing what they did. Uh, each time we go up there and challenge that, it takes a little notch out of that wall. And I think that's an important part that we all do. And it's not just the people who can uh, step across the line or sit in front of a car and keep people from going to work to do these deeds. It's all of us in our communities. And so we need to bring up that fact because people up there are no different than us. For the grace of God, uh, if I was a little bit smarter, God only knows what I would have ended up uh, making choices on. But uh, my path is different. I would like to bring them onto our path. Thank you. The address for the court is 2500 Trinity Drive. It's just west of Ashley Pond. It's easy to find. Um, yes, thank you. And, and I will just add to that comment that um, after hearing that all of our representatives participated in getting this bill 
passed, included in the NDAA, I think all of them deserve a phone call to hear from us that $70 million should not be going to the CMRR. Okay, so next up, we have spoken word and poetry from Richard Sober. Thank you for coming today, Richard. Read a few poems. Uh, the first two poems I'm going to read are uh, by an old friend of mine who lived from 1922 to about 2006. His name was Bill O'Connor. He was a teacher, a mathematician, a philosopher, a poet, uh, and a bookie. <laughs> August 6th. I want to go where the end of the world begins. Even in paradise, the fires of hell are burning. I am going to where the end of the world began. I'm going to Hiroshima and stare into the blind eye of memory. The end of the world is beginning there for the second and final time. August 6th is a very small boat in a sea of forgetfulness. It's called Because. Because the enemy has no face. Because the enemy wears our face. Because the face the enemy wears is a mask. Because we do not recognize our own face. Because the enemy lives in the mirror. Because the only thing that ever happens is news. Because of all these things. And because we believe we have fallen from grace. And because we believe death fell from the snake tree of knowledge. And because beyond the garden night falls. And because benighted we fall in love. And because today's photograph is old and history is the news of the Holocaust. Because of all these things. And because dead birds fall from the tree of life and whale song and wolf call fall down a graveyard wind of silence, and because bombs fell on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and because our mortality has become a nightmare, and because to rid ourselves of this nightmare, we kill the dreamer, and because every moment terrorizes the memory with visions of the future, and because history is a bloodbath of prophecy, because of all these things. And because death everywhere is falling like rain, and a death storm is brewing all over the world. Because the terror of infinity and the dread of finitude, because the dark enemy in the armored mirror wears the white mask of God. Because soon all the watches will be digitals and throwaways and the clocks be shocked by apocalypse. Because of all these things, because of all these things, and because of the heartbreaking Cold War and the heartless nuclear winter, and in death, gravity, the blue trajectory of the heavy heart. Oh, sisters, brothers, through earth's hurt, travel lightly toward hope's heartfelt light. <laughs> this is called The Brook, and it's by Hayden Carruth. Murmuring of the brook in late summer darkness, after moonset, as I lay sleepless on the porch cot. A music extraordinarily variable, each passage of water against its stone sounding a different pitch and rhythm. It was an uncivilized music in the foothills of the mountains, continuing long beyond the endurance of a human singer, almost beyond the endurance of a human listener. Syllables of unknown meaning, notes in an, on an unknown scale. A few fat yellow stars above the northern horizon. Without art, the song was perfectly artless. The unmeaning music and the unknowing listener were one in the loneliness of those distant places.
late summer nights in Vermont. Truly, the music meant nothing, no intimation, which was why I liked it so much. My brook murmuring all night in the darkness, and I meant nothing, and I liked that too. It's from a um, fragment of a poem that he never finished, but doesn't make any difference. I say this as a sketch and in a whisper, for it is not yet time. The game of unaccountable heaven is achieved with experience and sweat. And under purgatory's temporary sky, we often forget that the happy repository of heaven is a lifelong house that you carry everywhere. Thank you. elements, or one of the very important elements of our coming together and of the action that the Lionel Six took is to speak truth. Um, I recently was watching something, I don't remember what it was, and they spoke about how after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the news was blacked out pretty much about it, and the only reporter from the New York Times actually worked for the Defense Department. And so any news that came out to America about what happened was filtered through the Defense Department. And there was one other reporter who got in, they had to sneak in, it was this whole story, just to tell the truth. And I think that in this span of time, the horror and devastation of nuclear weapons has been, I can't even say forgotten, because I think for many people they never realize what they really do. And this is something so horrifying that the fact that we still have so many of these weapons and that there's a policy of our government to be able to build thousands more of them is really insane. And we can say it points to misguidance, we can say it points to corporate control of our government, and on and on and on. But I think our job as citizens is to speak the truth, to reveal the truth to whoever we know, whoever will listen. The press, our neighbors, our friends, our family. Because one of these bombs going off one more time would be horrific and it probably would not mean just one more bomb going off. So to continue in the vein of speaking truth, our next speaker is Mariel Manassi, the Executive Director of New Energy Economy, and we've already heard that we're all dealing with climate change, and this is such a crucial issue for our country and for the world, and Mariel is going to continue on that subject. Thank you, Mariel, for being here. Thank you. Be up for 
an Academy Award. So um, for all of you who haven't seen it, please, please go see it. It's really important movie. And one of the things that it points out is that the window of opportunity for salvaging a livable planet for our children and grandchildren is rapidly closing. My brief remarks seek to connect the dots between extreme weather, climate disruption, and the fossil fuel and war-making industries, and extreme profit that has been often left out of the discussion. Profit at the expense of a small, not money, but greed, extreme greed. Let's first look at the problem. As we begin 2013, we must reflect on 2012, a year of extreme weather from the melting of the Arctic, and you will see it in this movie, in Chasing Ice, because it's a time-lapse photography of the glaciers melting. And, it's, and um, what, what has melted between 2000 and 2000 and I think 10 is the same as what's melted, is that right? 2000 and 2010 and, no, no, from, from, from 1900 to 2000 is, this, is the same as what's melted between 2000 and 2010. That's it. That's, and you see it. So. Um, it's, it's the raw evidence. So from the melting of the Arctic to Superstorm Sandy to the massive typhoon in the Philippines that affected hundreds of thousands of people, parched earth, longer and more extreme droughts, which caused the largest, the longest, and the hottest wildfires in New Mexico history. The June 2011 Los Conscious Fire burned more than 150,000 acres, and that was then the largest fire in New Mexico history. And in May 2012, the Whitewater Baldy Fire set a new record when the wildfire raged, belching walls of smoke as it devoured 289,000 acres in the Gila Wilderness. Have any of you walked in those charred forests? I have had the, that's great. I've had the pleasure of actually walking with um, firefighters from Santa Fe in the, um, in, around Los Alamos at the Los Conscious Fire, and you are walking amongst tree skeletons. And they explained something to me that I had never understood before, that the, that the, the fire burned so hot that it actually scorched the earth. And when they talk about Erosion, it happens because there's nothing alive for the first foot or more of earth anymore. Those fires that devastated that um, at the, here as well as in the Gila might never ever come back again. Like, there will not be forests anymore there. And so when you walk there, you have this human imprint in your heart. It will affect you. I implore you all to feel the grit of life, to feel what we are doing to devastate this earth. And that's, that's what you feel when you're there. So walk amongst those tree skeletons. If you love New Mexico, you must visit those forests. The earth, the earth is being devastated. We only have one home. We have to protect it. And as you know, I, we, you know that we're in severe drought, but it's not only in New Mexico, it's across the United States. The U.S. Drought Monitor reported that two-thirds of the continental U.S. suffered drought conditions this summer. This means crops die and higher prices for food. And it also means that our forests are more vulnerable. They have been ravaged by the bark beetle. Die-offs of pinon pine and pine neurosis in Arizona and New Mexico totaled 2,600,000 acres. The trees are dying. We have to open our eyes. We have to open our hearts. So we need, badly need, governments to act to mitigate climate disruption. But of course governments have been acted at all in the last 25 years, despite overwhelming evidence of the fact that we are changing the chemistry of the very air we breathe. I took this photograph of Canium Woody 
He's um, five years old. He's five years old, and all he wants to do is breathe. It's the first thing we do when we are born. It's the last thing we do before we die. Breathing. We are changing the chemistry of the air. There is nothing more vital or fundamental than breathing. And look at this boy. He just wants to live, and yet he has to use a pump to breathe. He's, he's using this pump and whatever the asthma company is uh, that makes this pump, they put little bears on it to make it, I guess, more friendly for him to want. Um, and he lives under the toxic shadow of p and coal plant. And I'll get to that in a minute because there's a relationship between Bechtel and its practices in Los Alamos and p and and its practices that we have for electricity in New Mexico. One of the reasons is that the power of the fossil fuel and war making industries um, is so prevalent in our political system. And that's one of the reasons why governments have been so constrained and have refused to act. It's in Washington, it's in Los Alamos, and it's in Albuquerque. Extreme weather and extreme profit. I did a little research about Bechtel before, I spoke, before this today, and I just want to tell you that Bechtel is the largest construction and engineering company in the United States, ranking fifth largest privately held company in the U.S. As of 2010, Bechtel had $27.9 billion in revenue and had projects in nearly 40 countries. Just this year, Bechtel has been awarded so many contracts within the U.S. and abroad for building gas plants, wind turbines, solar plants, metal rail projects, more nuclear weapons facilities and uh, nuclear reactors in Washington, D.C., in Texas, California, Kazakhstan, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, to name a few. And they have been awarded <laughs> environmental awards, management awards, construction <laughs> awards, Bechtel was just named one of the world's top contractors by Engineering News Record, a leading publication for the engineering and construction industry. War profiteering and political cronyism is just part of this story. Um, and as if their profits in 2010 weren't enough, their revenue in 2011 was $32 billion, up 18% from the previous year, and they have new contracts um, estimated at about $150 billion. Riley Bechtel, who is the current CEO, is the fourth generation CEO, is a billionaire. He's worth $3 billion. He owns 20% of Bechtel with his father. Um, he's part of San Francisco. San Francisco's exclusive all-male Bohemian Club, whose fellows are thought to include every single Republican president since Herbert Hoover. Just from 1999 to 2002, Bechtel contributed, that's just the, 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 that period of time, Bechtel contributed over $1.3 million to federal campaigns and candidates, 60% to Republicans. Bechtel consi consistently uses insider connections. They're part of, um, they have literally an open door to um, the White House and the DOE and all sorts of other um, high level administration um, agencies, and the administration and agencies, excuse me. It uses its insider connections at the highest levels of government to obtain its contracts. Bechtel's history of environmental degradation, human rights abuse, cost overruns at taxpayer expenses, and privatization of public commodities is notoriously dismal. Yet until you and the Lionel Six, there has been virtually a media whiteout about all the underlying causes of these atrocities. There has also been a climate silence, if you will. May, maybe most of you know that coal is the single greatest um, driver of climate disruption, the defining and moral and ethical environmental challenge of our time. 
every day tons upon tons of carbon dioxide, um, nitrous oxides, sulfur dioxides, particulate matter, mercury, all from coal exact a staggering price. It's from living in a toxic shadow of PM's coal plants. <coughs> New Energy Economy commissioned a uh, study this in 2012. It's about to say this year, um, and uh, by a professor of environmental health at the New York University School of Medicine, and he determined that the public health cost just in the last five years from from one um, of the coal plants in New Mexico, PNM's coal plant, and it's an 1800 megawatt. Um, coal plants, one of the largest in the United States, cost New Mexicans $240 million. Those are the public health care costs. People like Katie and Woody who have had asthma and, um, and lung disease and respiratory illnesses of all sorts and heart attacks and strokes. The pollution coming from p and <coughs> coal plants are among the highest in America. Um, the San Juan generating station, which I will just tell you, um, coal, if we, when we turn on the light, 60% of our electricity comes from coal right now. Um, and most of it from the San Juan generating station. It produced more than 8.5 million tons of carbon pollution and does so every year. 8.5 million tons. Um, it also consumed 9.5 billion gallons of clean water. Clean water in, toxic water out. So, now to the profits, and that's where it's very similar to Bechtel. Um, we don't have the, our government um, producing electricity because it's, a, it's a now considered a human need. Um, but our needs are privatized, so it's privatized to Bechtel, it's privatized to P&M. And the profits for P&M in the last four years went up 2,500%. Um, actually, from 2008 to 2012. The top 12 executives at P&M saw, saw their income rise 93%, 93% in the last four years. So if they started making basically a million dollars, they've made two million dollars in four years. Meanwhile, our residential rates have gone up 41% in the last four years, so nearly doubled. See what we, so what we see is the vast transfer of wealth from public coffers into the hands of a very few. Fossil fuel companies, war industries, food industries, they are corrupting our democracy, polluting our skies, causing murder and mayhem, and obese and unhealthy people here at home. So what to do? Um, oh, I just wanted to show you this also. When I talk about polluting skies, I took this photograph, and this haze that, that we see here is caused by these coal plants. And just 10 years ago, um, uh, when I first moved to New Mexico, this wasn't uh, there when we looked at the sunsets. But now you see that brown line, and that is from the coal plants. So I want to talk about courage, because that the, was the title of my talk. Um, and that's what we saw here by the level six, with that kind of moment when, am I going to act or am I not going to act? I, um, I believe in action. I believe in talking truth to power. And I wanted to tell you something. Um, I was just in South Africa, and I went to the Apartheid Museum, and there's a quote there by, from Nelson Mandela, one of my heroes, and he said that, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave, he said man, but I'll say, the brave person is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. And I think that's really important because as I stand before you right now, I got a little witness under my arms. <laughs> and when and when you take action, you know, it's not that you don't feel afraid. And I've spoken in front of a lot of people 
for many, many years, and I'm still a little afraid. Like, am I going to sound smart? Are you going to like me? Do you want to contribute to my work? I mean, a million things, right, go through our, my head. But it's not that those things don't exist anymore. It's that when you feel them, you, you acknowledge it, and you still walk through that fear. And that's what the Lionel Six did. And that's what I'm asking you to do. Because now, more than ever, we need you. And we need you not only just to talk to the people that you know. We need you to talk to the people that you don't know. And if you're worried about, well, that person doesn't look like me, they don't have this, they're not the, of the same color, they're not of the same class, they're not of the same whatever, 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 things, more things that we have built up to keep us from each other, um, you got to do it anyway. That's part of the courage. That's part of the courage. And you know, we're, we're acting now in the, faith, in the time of climate disruption, we're acting with courage and we're also acting with heart against our own isolation and alienation that keeps us, you know, like that terrible feeling inside, the terrible gut, like where you're just like, oh, I want to do something but I don't know how to do. You need to reach out and say to the person, I too don't know what to do, or let's do this together. And the more togetherness we have, the more uh, ability we'll have to act. Because we need collaboration, we need engagement, and we need to be willing to step out of our comfort zone. And when we do, we will have success. And I love winning. Um, I really do. I love winning. Um, and I've had little wins this year. Some of you have been in part of that. Um, and when you win together, then it spurs you on to have more wins. Because we can do better if we're together. So I want to just leave you with one last thing, um, an image in your mind. Because I believe in activist DNA, and that helix. The double helix of both resistance and creating alternative visions is what, of what is possible. So my form of activism is resisting what's wrong, basically fighting p and on everything that they do, I'll tell you. Fighting to shut down the coal plants, and then creating what's possible. You know, PM also says, and I think they've done it quite effectively, as many commercials and, and the natural gas industry, they'll show like a little girl with a daisy and say, Oh, solar panels? That's really nice, but it's too cost it's too costly and um it's too costly and it only works, you know, when the sun's out. So, um, we need oil, gas, and coal, and we need to go kill people to get it. Um, and so, um, so I thought, I don't have millions of dollars to have commercials, but I could raise $50,000 from people like you, a dollar, two dollars, ten dollars, twenty thousand dollars at a time, and put solar on a fire station, which we did, and then made the front page of the Santa Fe New Mexican, and it was a great success. And even though it was little, the celebration was so huge. People were so happy, and they felt so good, and they were so together. And lots of people were together. There were like high school students there, and then there was the mayor, and all sorts of in-between. And then there were these rows of firefighters. Rows of firefighters. And I got to know them, and they took me out to the forest, where the and they taught me stuff. And I didn't know a firefighter beforehand. I'd never met a firefighter beforehand. And so now I have these people who I could call on. And that's what I'm talking about, about crossing, not crossing the line and say, oh, you know, Democrats are public. I mean, <laughs> us crossing, getting to know our neighbors, or getting to know a high school student, or getting to know a firefighter. Because it's a matter of our survival. Let that just sink in. It's a matter of our survival. It's a matter of our humanity. And Jeff referred to the ACT UP movement. It was actually the very first present that he gave me when we started to date. I still have the t-shirt. And um, do you remember their slogan? It's a pink triangle. And it says, silence equals death. And I think that that's true. They were facing their own death. We are now facing death of humanity. Unless we stop being silent. And so we have to talk. They wanted to save lives, and they saved millions of lives because they refused to be silent. 
They put their lives on the line because they recognized that their survival was on the line. We need to recognize the same thing. The Lattle Six are to be congratulated because they acted with principle. They refused to be silent in the face of war making and a savage distortion of our humane priorities. When we are spending 88 times on defense as what we should be on climate, we need to speak up. And if it's, if it's using money as the, as, the, um, as the reason, let's use it. We must talk about greed. We must talk about extreme profit at the expense of our survival. We must talk to each other so that we can build a climate movement that shudders coal, collects more solar and wind, and saves millions of lives. Because our lives, our children's lives, our great-grandchildren's lives are on the line. Thank you to the Lionel Six. Thank you for having me.